This episode is brought to you by our incredible community of listener supporters on Patreon. Our Patreon offers listeners exclusive archival content, extended episodes, and access to community conversations diving deeper with past guests. Right now, we are $2,000 away from reaching our $5,000 of listener support each month. Your monthly pledge ensures that For the Wild has the funding to keep producing informative, thoughtful, and rooted conversations and programming. All funding supports our small team of creatives, podcast production, and special For the Wild projects like our zines and slow study courses. To support us on Patreon, please visit patreon.com slash for the wild, or if you would rather make a one-time donation or recurring donation outside of Patreon, please visit for the wild.world slash donate. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with James Bridal. There's this incredible total communication and awareness going on all around us all the time at every single level of life. Intelligence is way, way more interesting than anything we could build in a box. But for some reason, we always seem to need to build the box first. We always seem to need to make these kind of toy versions of things before suddenly then we start to recognize that they're already all around us in the world. James Bridal is a writer, artist, and technologist. Their artworks have been commissioned by galleries and institutions and exhibited worldwide Their writing on literature, culture, and networks has appeared in magazines and newspapers including Wired, The Atlantic, The New Statesman, The Guardian, and Financial Times. They are the author of New Dark Age 2018 and Ways of Being 2022, and they wrote and presented New Ways of Seeing for BBC Radio 4 in 2019. Their work can be found at www.jamesbridal.com. James, thanks so much for joining us today. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Thanks very much for having me. Lovely to be here. I love that we both have bird song in our background, although yours sounds like songbirds and mine is a raven who's probably wanting to get into my compost. But yeah, I'm looking forward to jumping into AI and algorithms. And as we begin, I want to think through some of the hmm, insidious and invisible ways algorithms and AI shape our lives. So to start the conversation, I'm wondering how the goals and programs of these algorithms are tailored to a specific view of the world and who and what are these algorithms serving? Well, I mean, that's a pretty broad place to start, but not a bad one uh, in the sense that, I mean, you know, these are these are quite vague terms, AI algorithms, things like this. But then they're always kind of intentionally vague. I think when you when you when you hear them being deployed, there's always something that's kind of missing in the conversation, like some kind of level of understanding or some level of specificity that really matters. But you know, the 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 place that we hear them deployed the most is in mostly these days in relationship to like the big tech companies. So you know, I mean, pretty much anything you do. That involves touching a computer, you know, and not just the obvious ones. I mean, like the ATMs or even the computer in your car, because most cars are computers. Those, those are algorithms. Those, an algorithm just means a computer program. Um, it's, it's any bit of computing machinery, which is kind of throughout all these parts of our lives these days. But mostly, what we where we hear when we talk about that is, is you know, the kind of the stuff that's made by companies, because that's who makes most of the tech in the world around us. And so, of course, then. You know, they're they're making those programs as part of a part of kind of profit systems, systems that at some level are trying to make a profit, make money, and that money largely out of us. You know, every time we use a computer system, there's an expectation that somewhere, somewhere is is benefiting from our use of that. And so some profit is being extracted. And that means that so many of the systems of, you know, in the world around us are built with this, you know, need to extract or exploit at some level built into their very basic philosophy. They don't come from a place of cooperation or collaboration. They come, you know, pretty much explicitly from places of exploitation. Um, and I, I think, you know, most of us are kind of aware of that these days. We know that that our use of, of things for free on the internet, search engines and so on, come with a kind of cost to our privacy. Um, you know, but that logic is embedded in every aspect of our lives. It's not a sort of technology question, but a question of capitalism. You know, 
get money off at the grocery store if you use your loyalty card, right? Which is just the same exchange of personal data for some kind of discount. Um, and, and that logic has been so kind of imbued into our everyday lives that I always notice when it extends into, into kind of bigger things as well. And, you know, one of those places is now contemporary artificial intelligence. And we can talk about what that means. I put very, very large scare quotes around AI at this point. But the AI that we all hear about at the moment is that made by these very large tech companies, you know, whose, um, whose position is the same. They're looking to make money out of this thing. And they're breeding a kind of intelligence that is based on this kind of profit motive. And, you know, my, my feeling, and I'm sure we'll go into this, is that that kind of intelligence, or rather that idea of intelligence, is just this incredibly narrow one. We expect it from our uh, interactions with capital in various forms, that these kind of expectation of exploitation is built in but i think it becomes a very different thing when uh when we're kind of interacting with things that claim to be intelligent but also have this kind of intensely predatory basis built into them um but that's the world that certain sectors of the world are trying to construct at the moment and that i think is very poorly understood i want to go uh, into a quote from your book ways of being and you write that's what happens. It would seem when the development of AI is led primarily by venture-funded technology companies, the definition of intelligence, which is framed, endorsed, and ultimately constructed in machines as a profit-seeking, extractive one. This framing is then repeated in our books and films and the news media and the public imagination. In science fiction tales of robot overlords and all-powerful, irresistible algorithms, until it comes to dominate our thinking and understanding. We seem incapable of imagining intelligence any other way, end quote. I'd love to hear how has this control and development of AI by venture capitalists hijacked our capacity to imagine intelligence beyond exponential growth? Well, because they started with things long before intelligence. Um, you know, we, we, we seem very incapable of imagining really society beyond a, a paradigm of exponential growth. So I, I think it's quite... Um, quite understandable how a vision of intelligence has kind of been hijacked in that way. What, where you see it coming out most strongly at the moment is looking at the areas in which, you know, this, this thing that gets called AI by a certain sector of industry really gets applied. And it gets applied to things that they find interesting, but also often things that they, they think are sort of, you know, easy or, or kind of low value in certain ways. So what we had was a you know a long period of where AI was largely about um, games of various kinds, you know, playing chess, playing Go, playing these kind of things, and you get AI being applied to to service industries, logistics, things that again are seen as kind of low status or low skilled. Driving actually being one of them, though it turns out to have been much much more complicated than they ever imagined, as most of these things do. Um, and now the latest wave is hitting at the level of kind of secretarial work data work uh, at the level of language, things like chat GPT, uh, but also critically, I think, at this level of image generation. Because again, you have this idea from the perspective of technology companies that, that that's something that must be easy, right? That's something that's for, for people who trade in algorithms and mathematics exclusively, that that kind of visual creativity is also something easy, something low status that can be conquered in, in this way. Like none of these things are easy, in fact. Like there's there's lots of really interesting things that happens when this gets applied to games. Things get more complicated, things get more interesting. Um turns out it it's very, very difficult to apply to real world things like driving. That's actually been, you know, not a huge success. And it's you know, it's it's um a totally different thing when it gets applied to writing or to image making, to creation, what we think of as these very human forms of creation as well. But they have such sort of power and glamour in society that also gets taken very seriously. And so you get a kind of degradation of those forms. Um, you get an even kind of lower status assigned to the kinds of work that these companies direct AI at, whether that's, you know, driving the increased kind of automation of um, delivery, logistics services, whether that's kind of delivery things, whether it's taxi driving, all these kind of things. Um, also now getting applied to the things that were regarded as, as kind of creative professions as well, even though the product is still terrible. There's just, you know, the power and the glamour of these things. They're, they're, the fact that they get wrapped up into these strange technological terms make them um, capable of still twisting our idea of 
I guess what's important and what matters about these things on a very deep level. Yeah, it's complicated. And there's another piece that you wrote, The Great Distractor. You say, quote, to actually interfere with the money-making algorithm at the level required to actually protect children, democracy, and our sanity would mean reducing the scale of their business. For a company whose business is scale, which cannot operate except at scale, that presents an existential threat. Treating the problem would mean they would cease to exist, end quote. So yeah, I just want to riff on the issue with seeing profit as godlike or a guiding principle here. Because if that's the basis of the project, you know, what are people not willing to do? Yeah, I mean, it's worth putting that um, quote into a bit of context, I think. So that was part of a kind of ongoing work um, about contemporary media um, and about the way online video, content, creativity works. And very specifically, a, a lot of studies I've done of um, uh, children's media online, things like YouTube for kids, uh, the way small children use media, and the way that that's the media ecosystem, particularly things like YouTube, has been like shaped around them. And so what you have happening there is that you have um, what gets called the attention economy, or surveillance capitalism, which is a system for making money off getting people's attention, quite simply. Um, the more eyeballs in the terminology that are on a thing, the more money will be made. And then when that system is largely automated, really, really weird and often quite terrible stuff starts happening. I you know, first encountered it really strongly and wrote quite a lot about what happens when that happens to like kids' content. So you get children's cartoons that are increasingly uh, designed partly by humans, but also partly by the kind of feedback loops of these profit machines to get longer to get stranger, to get more addictive for small children in very unhealthy ways, and that sometimes also are then susceptible to really nasty content, violent content, sexual content being kind of threaded into them. But the system at that point becomes so complex and large that no one really understands what's going on. It's very hard to intervene. And to intervene would mean shutting the system down. Now, I think the system should mostly be shut down in that case. Um, we, we're in this very weird position now where technology and the technological companies behind them have got such kind of momentum that it's almost impossible to imagine that you would just shut them down. So this isn't just, isn't just a problem for like children's media, although it is a huge problem with children's media. It's a problem for all of us. It's well documented now that there's a kind of radicalization process that happens when people view content online uh, that is ordered for them algorithmically, whether that's kind of YouTube videos or the Facebook news feed, because that system wants you to watch more ends up showing you more and more extreme content. So people get pushed into like positions of very extreme radicality, whether that's the far right, uh, religious extremism, um, or just kind of absolutely insane conspiracy theories. The algorithm wants you to pay more attention, it will feed you more extreme content, and your position will be moved to this more and more extreme place. And you know, my counterexample for that is always like, you know, imagine there was a stop, a shop on your local high street, your, your main street, whatever it is, you know, and one in 10 people who went in there um, came out believing in the supremacy of the white race, like, we would shut it down. <laughs> like, it's just fundamentally um, something that we would say, like, there's all kinds of complex issues here, but we should stop this particular thing being present within our society. And we seem really incapable of doing that within technological cultures that exists at the moment um, because of this kind of weird glamour that technology has, uh, this claim that people don't really understand it fully, that people are scared to like speak about it fully, um, that it's somehow disconnected from our culture. And you see this happening now again. You know, As I said, I've been writing about this extensively about television media, or children's cartoons, but also adult social media, whatever it is. You see it happening now with AI, that you have what are not intelligent at all, but are like very powerful computer systems fed on the last couple of decades of all of our personal information being kind of unleashed into the world with what will be huge consequences. And what we actually have is, is the people building it going around the world telling us that like the robot overlords are coming and we should worry about that and not about the kind of incredibly predatory forms of profit extraction that they're actually doing. Uh, it's the most extraordinary piece of kind of misdirection that they've attempted in some time um, and is very blatant. And it seems to be working very well, but it's um, 
yeah, it's just it's such a strange thing that capitalism in its current form is just so good at moving onto these new territories as it always does. While we are seeming capable of sort of talking meaningfully or, or directly about it. It really concerns me. Let me start over because a lot of this concerns me. There's of course the media piece and the piece around impacting and influencing children, which to me, that is a real cultural issue. Just everything that feeds into how us as a humanity understand things, believe in our value systems, the fact that AI is going that deep is really frightening. And then the other thing that maybe frightens me as much is how AI and algorithms are also now playing a role in extraction. And there's another quote in your book, Ways of Being, that speaks to Repsol, which has this relationship with Google, and it's putting advanced machine learning algorithms to work across networks of oil refineries, helping boost efficiency and output and things of that nature. So I just wanted to dive in a bit about how AI is being used to further extraction. You think about industrialization and how quickly that ramped up the rate of destruction of the planet. And I can only imagine now what AI could do in terms of that speed of extraction. Yeah, I mean, so what's happening within that kind of fossil fuel economy at the moment is that you have the weird paradox that as we approach um, the limits of that fossil fuel economy, i.e. we start to, you know, we've basically extracted everything that's relatively easy to extract and what's left is kind of gets harder and harder but as a result it also gets more valuable uh, because we're completely failing to transition away from it um so the world is still just in much need of what's there um and so what is there just kind of keeps increasing in value even if it's hard to get so it becomes more rewarding to get out even though it's harder but i have to push back a bit on the idea that this is really about ai and algorithms yes of course having you know more powerful computer systems does allow you to drill more efficiently, to do more fine-grained surveys, to identify deposits that would not have been so obvious before, et cetera, et cetera. It does allow for that. And of course, it allows it at a like, higher level and so on and so forth compared to the techniques that were going on before. But really, this is just in line with a much broader trajectory of capitalism, which is always going to go and extract these things anyway. It just now has AI as a tool to do it. But there'd be guys out there with chisels if they didn't have AI. Like... In that sense, it really is just a tool that's being put to use. And I think it's really important when we talk about algorithms and AI that we don't do it in this kind of abstract way where we kind of point at a computer and go, oh, it's the computer doing the scary thing. It's very clear in cases like this that it is the industry that is doing this thing. It is, you know, it is the fossil fuel companies and their allies in the technology company who um, are continuing to do work which is going to result in vast destruction of life across this planet. And that's just not a technological question. That's a social and political question. It's a question about our culture and what we're prepared to do and how much we're prepared to change. And, and really, you know, for me, it's like AI is so not interesting, right? particularly this kind of AI, which is just really powerful computers. Like it's interesting how powerful those computers are. But then when you see what they're being put to use for, you realize that they are just the building block of something much more powerful, which is the kind of the the profit motive and the the selfishness and stupidity that's associated with that. What that realization should do is kind of shift our attention away from this kind of glamour of AI and algorithms to understand that technology really is just a tool. And it's a tool that we can make choices about. Uh, that we can have opinions about, that we can think about quite clearly, uh, rather than getting lost in a kind of technological determinism. By technological determinism, I mean this sort of feeling that most of us have that technology just does what it does, uh, irrespective of our desires. Um, you know, we may not like what it's doing, but oh well, that's just you know what happens when you apply technology. Well, it's not. It's result the culture rather in which those technologies are produced. We have a a culture of fossil fuel dependency and we have a culture of seeing the earth as a resource for extraction and really as i said it doesn't matter in that culture whether you use a teaspoon or an ai to extract the oil people are going to go after that oil and it's the kind of culture and thinking around this stuff that needs to change no i think that makes a lot of sense 
And I'm sure that those of us who want to continue extracting will create more and more tools to support that extraction, whether it's AI or some other technological tool moving into the future. But I also wanted to speak about different forms of intelligence. And I'm just considering that as we reckon with the reality that intelligence may be far more than our human-centric minds once believed, I'm interested in the multiple paths of intelligence that's possible. What might it look like to recognize artificial intelligence alongside more than human intelligence more broadly? Yeah, I mean, this is this is in part why I get frustrated with this kind of very narrow vision of intelligence that's promoted by those who talk about AI a lot, because um, it's just it's such a like a pathetically narrow way of seeing the world. Um, like it, it, <laughs> even leaving aside all the hideous like actual damage that it does, it's also just this extraordinary failure of the imagination. Now, I've been working with AI. In, again, this thing that gets called AI in various forms for like a couple of decades. And, you know, it, it's always this constant oh, question to work out, like, what is interesting about this thing? How does it allow us to think things that we haven't thought before? Like, well, one more interesting definition of intelligence is not like, how does this allow us to do the same stupid things we've been doing forever, just faster and harder? but rather how does it allow us to think new thoughts about the world? And one of the things, one of the new thoughts about the world that for me AI allowed me to think was this, this slow and dawning realization that machine intelligence, whatever it is, is something different to human intelligence. And that comes really, you know, without all the other interesting things that I'll talk about in a moment, that comes from just a direct engagement with the, the technology as a, a totally like rational a uh, quite narrow humanist perspective you know for for the last decades upon decades like from, since the 1940s if not you know some theorizing before computer scientists have been trying to build this thing called ai expecting it to be like human intelligence basically expecting to make something that acted in the world like a human being or thought in the world like a human being and every time we try it out in all these different problems it does stuff that we don't really expect um it, it, it behaves in very different ways. You see it in, in everything from the way that it plays chess to the way that it um, sorts information to the way that it understands, categorizes, and acts upon the world, which is what most forms of intelligence do, some forms of intelligence do. It just does it in a radically different way to humans, and that's really fascinating. It, it means you can collaborate with it in like interesting ways if you treat it as a collaborator rather than just as a kind of um, a device or a slave but at a higher level, it also says, well, hey, like there are m different ways of doing intelligence more generally. Like that human intelligence, even in the thing that we created that we thought was going to be like a human intelligence, turns out to be something quite different. That intelligence is, in fact, just for starters, some kind of spectrum. That there are different kind of ways of doing it. And so for me, I, I, I come to believe quite fundamentally that you know the, the cultural purpose of, of artificial intelligence is really to be something that forces us to recognize that within the kind of Western kind of rationalist enlightenment position, you know, which is not by any necessity the majority position of this planet. Um, we're, we're bad at recognizing. We're not good at acknowledging the intelligence of non-humans in any meaningful way. In fact, we've tended to restrict this term intelligence really pretty much to humans, the standard definition of it. And, and suddenly we find even in this thing that we've built ourselves, something unhuman going on in terms of its intelligence and you know the straight up first result from that kind of experimental result is that oh okay there's more than one way of doing intelligence and if more than one then multiple then potentially infinite you know um my view on technologies in general uh, however much they're used or misused they are always downstream of culture they are products of the cultures that we have and and they tell us something quite often about our culture. You know, I spent most of my most of my life, in fact, as a teenager anyway, thinking too much about the internet and thinking that to the extent to which it is this kind of incredible flowering of culture that no one really set out to build or think about, and yet is kind of the greatest cultural invention since probably language itself. And likewise, I, I think our obsession with intelligence and AI is is a 
is a kind of often unconscious, mostly unconscious, but not dissimilar desire to manifest some aspect of this non-human intelligence in the world so that we can feel closer to it, so that we can understand it better, so that it can essentially open our eyes to all of the other intelligences that exist in the world. It turns out that intelligence is, is way, way more interesting than anything we could build in a box. But for some reason, and this is something I have not figured out yet, but I'm endlessly fascinated with, we always seem to need to build the box first. We always seem to need to like make these kind of toy versions of things before suddenly then we start to recognize that they're already all, all around us in the world. To follow this thread of intelligence a bit more, I'm thinking about as AI was created by humans, can we see it as an extension of human intelligence? And with that, how has our limited understanding of intelligence come to shape AI in the vein of distinctly human intelligence? I guess I'd say to the idea of um, an extension of human intelligence is that like, human intelligence is an extension of something else, which is a, a much more generalized form of intelligence. The way that I've come to understand it, to thinking about the intelligence of, of beings more generally, animals, plants, ecosystems, machines, is that, you know, it's, it's the human intelligence. That is one way of doing intelligence. And, and you know, the couple of the main things that I write about in the book, in Ways of Being, are the fact that kind of the more you treat other things as intelligent, the more you come to recognize that intelligence is, isn't something that just happens in the head. Right, and it isn't it isn't something that just happens to humans, and it isn't something that just happens inside the head. It's something that's embodied and it's relational, uh, which means it's something that happens with your whole body. Uh, that's a result of your embodied experience of the world. There's no such thing as a brain in a jar. There just can't be. Um, it makes no sense to to be disconnected from the world in that way. And there's no such thing as um, as an intelligence without anything else to connect to. So intelligence is also relational. It emerges from our our uh, encounters with other beings and other bodies in the world. So yeah, I mean, we've we've always had this we, and that, let's let's clarify that we quite a lot. The way in which the kind of uh, Western scientific enlightenment view of intelligence has been essentially what humans do. But you can look back through the last few hundred years of um, what philosophy and scientifically has kind of shaped uh, our idea of it, of intelligence, and it always essentially boils down to what humans do. You can draw these kind of other little qualities of it, and there's all these kind of interesting experiments in which test out other creatures to what extent they are intelligent, but the benchmark of what intelligence is is always human. So the, so the, the way in which we test other intelligence is always, how much are you like us? And that's an in, just you know an incredibly narrow view if you understand the world as a kind of an ecological system of which humans are only just one part. And our intelligence is only one of many that has evolved on this planet because of the particular ways in which we have evolved. The, the, the way that I've kind of come to see and think intelligence is, is crucially is, um, uh, you know, is not purely the domain of the human and also not purely something that happens inside the head. You know, we tend to think of intelligence as this kind of like brain activity, this thing that just you know, happens inside our skulls. But that's really, again, another kind of, very reductive way of seeing it. Um, intelligence is embodied. Um, it's something that happens like with our whole, with our whole body, as, as a result of the kind of body plan that we have. Um, one of my favourite, you know, experiments that really, to me, shows this is um, is experiments that were done with other um, apes, uh, in which they tried to do this. You know, which where they tried to sort of quantify this intelligence of other species. You know, one of the standard tests is, is the kind of ability to think and think ahead or make plans or to use tools. And so a classic intelligence test on other species is to, you know, put some poor animal in a cage and give it a stick, place a little treat outside the cage and see what happens. And lots of apes are 
ourselves included, are quite good at this um, and would quite quickly use the stick to grab the treat. But um, for a long time, gibbons in particular and noticeably were really bad at this test. They failed it all the time. And uh, it was it was kind of decades of basically science treating gibbons as being dumber than than other apes, which made no sense kind of evolutionarily or socially. But they just, they refused to like do this test until someone redesigned the experiment and they hung the sticks uh, from the top of the gibbons enclosure. And the moment they did this, the gibbons kind of immediately reached up, grabbed the stick, and like got the treat. And like in that moment, in the way that we structure the world gibbons became intelligent but of course they're intelligent all along but they're brachiators which means they live in the trees uh, and along with various other kind of bodily adaptations that there are kind of awareness and thinking is oriented upwards because of their body plan because of the the sociality of their lives of, of everything and so their operate their intelligence is just kind of pointed in this slightly different direction of course they're smart they're just thinking about other things and, and meeting the world in a different way because of their different body. And that's true for every other thing on this planet. Um, it's embodied and also it's relational. So it's about this kind of encounter that we have with other beings and with other creatures. And that has, you know, understanding intelligence as being both embodied and relational has um, implications for us uh, and for, hu for humans meeting other humans. Uh, for cultures meeting different human cultures, it has implications for our relationship with other non-human species of all kinds, animals, plants, ecosystems, as I say. Um, and it also has you know, implications for machine intelligence as well, um, that we we start to think of, you know, particularly artificial intelligence as not being, you know, just a different or lesser or form of, of human intelligence, but really an, another type of intelligence arising in the world. And um, that is, you know, as interesting or not as any other kind. Yeah, I would like to follow this thread a bit more and talk about more than human intelligence. And another quote from Ways of Being, you write, I began to realize that the forest was filled with a constant hum of unseen signs and unheard chatter. Decisions were being made, agreements reached, bargains made and broken, unquote. And of course, as a forest dweller, I loved this quote. I felt very connected and agree on so much of that. But I just want to hear you describe some of the other forms of intelligence you've encountered in your research for this book and generally within your relationship to the more than human world. You know, the, the beautiful thing about starting to see this world is that you really begin to see it in you know, every, every place you look. And, and, and every kind of encounter that you have, the, the ways in which intelligence in its various forms manifest. Um, but I mean, you've given, um, you know, the example of the forest, um, which is both an example of the intelligence of trees, the way individual tree species uh, communicate um, uh, and sense their surroundings in all these kind of marvelous ways. You know, not just with others of their own species or with their kin, which they do do, but also, you know, across species and in these kind of networks with with fungi and, and other beings as well. Um, uh, you know, that's the kind of the holistic kind of ecological view of it. You can also look at like, you know, these incredibly like specific examples of, of intelligence or you know kind of thinking. Um, so I think of something like the slime molds, um, which I read about a fair bit, you know, which in one particular aspect of something that they do um, are very akin to a machine intelligence in that it is possible to work with slime molds in such a way that you, you can get them to essentially perform a type of mathematical operation. Now, there's a thing called the traveling salesman problem, which is this like really gnarly mathematical problem that simply asks, like, given six cities on a map, how do you visit each one, you know, in the shortest uh, possible time, kind of only once? very valuable problem for like logistics companies but a problem that humans and and also computers are really terrible at it's a problem we face in various forms all the time um but the mathematics of, of figuring out the best answer are really hard and critically it's uh what's called an exponentially hard problem so every time you add a city it gets way 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 harder um but it turns out slime molds uh, one of the things that slime molds do you know is that they spread around these little kind of damp wiggly patches on the on the forest floor finding bits of food and, and finding the shortest route between them turns out they solve this problem this particular kind of what to us is a mathematical problem is to them is just looking for food 
uh, they're, but they're capable of solving this problem better than than us or, or any of our greatest supercomputers. They're doing, they're thinking this problem in a way that we have thus far no access to at all. So it's this like very specific form of intelligence. And then you know, thinking uh, intelligence kind of relationally as just like an awareness of the world and an acting upon it. I think one of the most beautiful examples I've I've come across recently is in the book I write quite a lot about the intelligence of um, honeybees, for example, who are you know reasonably well known these days for being brilliant like communicators, but also political decision makers. Um, honey bees collect information about the world around their nests, particularly the location of their nectar sources, that they return to their hives and they do this amazing dance, the waggle dance, to communicate um, the location of nectar sources. They do this little kind of running around in circles, wiggling their bums dance, and that tells the other bees how far to fly and at what angle to the sun in order to find the nectar. And they do this with nesting sites as well. So when the hive wants to move, Honeybees will go out as scouts, find new nesting sites, and then they'll bring that information back and they'll do the dance. But then multiple bees will dance different locations uh, in a kind of form of debate uh, while the different locations are checked out until gradually through a kind of process of essentially direct democracy, a consensus is reached and the whole hive you know, goes off to one of these new locations. It's an incredible job of collective information synthesis and consensus building uh, on the hive of hundreds, sometimes thousands of bees uh, that some have kind of likened as well to like the way in which our neurons or really our whole bodies kind of synthesize information. This kind of mass information synthesis is a very hard problem, but which evolution has solved in all of these different ways, just as it appears to have solved the problem of intelligence. Well, not the problem of intelligence, the opportunity of intelligence, perhaps, in all of these radically different ways in different kind of embodied life forms. But I was just reading the other day something that isn't in the book as well, that um, that I just can't stop thinking about, which is that it's not just the bees that are out there, um, like looking around, being smart, gathering information, aware of the world around them. Um, the flowers are too. Uh, recent research has shown that um, flowering plants, perhaps in general, certain, certainly many species of flowers individually, perceive the vibrations of the wings of their pollinators, usually um, honeybees, but also moths as well for some species. They perceive the specific frequency of those pollinators and they change their behavior as a result. So within a few seconds or a few minutes of hearing, being vibrated by this frequency, hearing, hearing the bee, the flower increases the, um, the sweetness of its nectar in response in order to you know, attract first one pollinator and maybe repeat visits from others. Um, the flower hears the bee. There's this incredible total communication and awareness going on all around us all the time at every single level of life, uh, most of which we are radically unaware of and may remain unaware of forever, but nevertheless exists. Those are such beautiful examples. Thank you for sharing that. I really also appreciate how you speak of the networks of intelligence and the myth of the individual. And I think there's so much there in terms of on what you've written about with humility and superiority and yeah, just the myth of independence. So I'd love if you could speak to some of these large themes that you talk about in you definitely one of your pieces called what is our relationship with alien consciousness and another forms of writing that you've shared the piece you're referring to is really just i guess one of the first times i'd stated plainly or i tried to write something and realized what i was saying about this this moment of realization that the artificial intelligence was a kind of gateway to thinking about other intelligences more broadly and that, you know, the dominant science and kind of Western Enlightenment thought is to narrow down. The main result of, of Enlightenment science is that we, um, we've tended to understand the world by breaking it apart, breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces, splitting things apart and separating them from one another. 
and that's um you know the largely the, the experience of the individual in modernity as well the experience of, of atomization and alienation that we feel not just from from the world but um but from one another that is a, a product of modernity uh, in its various forms and a product of you know, and, and the scientific method has done the same to knowledge um split it into all these discrete pieces and one of the things that you see that i find to be most characteristic of of kind of newer ecological sciences is they're largely about putting these things back together again um you know botany being a good example where um we've we've always treated plants in particular as essentially tiny machines cutting them up into smaller pieces until we get down to the cells removing the leaves the flowers the stems the roots seeing these as, as kind of mechanistic pieces rather than as wholes as whole organisms with their own behaviors and desires and much else and so much of the work i think is is kind of putting these these holes back together putting organisms back together uh, and then starting to put systems ecosystems back together and that you know really applies to us as well the myth politically of the of the selfish individual is you know tightly tied to ideas of the the kind of intact bodily individual which is not scientifically sensible there there is really no such thing as the as an individual at the physical level um we are made utterly and totally out of everything else you know from whether that's the biome uh, that keeps us alive the kind of 2 kilograms or so of, of other organisms that live in our gut in our skin uh and kind of on the surface of our bodies that are utterly intrinsic to our health what washed cleanse antibiotic off them we will die we are living communities of beings of which the kind of human part of us is is not the whole and is is actually at the limit kind of completely indistinguishable from the rest your ability to solve complex mathematical tasks is affected by the health of the gut flora if you change the makeup of these kind of bacteria in your gut you your your brain will operate differently so there's there's no clear boundary there and that goes all the way down like into our into our basic cells and most of our dna you know has has come to us at various points from, from other species we we we're, we're the result of dna being kind of written and cross written for millennia and not just through the kind of systems of linear descent that we've all been taught in school the darwinian kind of atomization of the genetic line this belief that we are just like this kind of you know splicing of our direct parents in fact the our genetic history and thus like our, our bodies our beings are far far more complicated than that we're the product of all kinds of strange homogenizations and unexpected encounters that go back throughout the entirety of our evolutionary history and you know once you start to to knock away at the basis of that evolutionary individualism um kind of have to knock away at the the political and the social individualism as well you have to start seeing these things as being you know ecological to the root um composed of of multiples at all levels you know you start to kind of float free of a lot of the kind of assumptions that we make about our bodies and about ourselves as a species about our superiority and our relationship to the rest of the world and i think it's a really it's a really critical realization to come to this kind of series of realizations about the uh, the dependency of if each of us on other members of our species and other members of of this planet it's a really fundamental realization that i think is also you know essentially kind of critical to our survival and and makes a kind of rethinking of our place and relations absolutely necessary um once we understand that we are the product of all this kind of extraordinary heterogenization over billions of years uh it makes almost everything that we're doing right now almost completely nonsensical that's a perfect way to say it <laughs> i i often feel like the ecocidal decisions we're making right now are a type of insanity and truly don't make sense for our survival or even our fulfillment i don't think we're happier for it or more well of course So yeah, I appreciate you speaking to that. And another topic that I found really interesting that you write about is the ecology of technology. And in your book Ways of Being, you say, quote, "An ecology of technology then is concerned with the interrelationships between technology and the world, its meaning, 
and materiality, its impacts and uses beyond the everyday deterministic fact of its own existence, end quote. So I'd love to hear from you, why is it important to contextualize technology in this way, especially as new forms of technology become more and more embedded within our daily lives and rituals? To um, start for better accounting for um, what it was that, like my use of technology in particular, how that related to the planet. Now, something that I've thought about for a long time is the way in which when things become, use a funny word here, think of a better one, technologized, when they kind of slip into computer programs and behind screens and so, it's, it's one of the kind of ultimate abstractions we have from the world. You know, if you're working with physical materials in various ways, then they have more of a, a connection, obvious connection to the world around them. If you're making something out of wood or you're throwing a piece of plastic into the bin, there's an opportunity there at least to understand the relationship that that sits within various kind of systems, networks of kind of use appropriation and uh, waste or whatever it is um that becomes so much more abstract when you do that through through a screen through technology you know you and i are talking to each other now across vast distances across pretty much half the planet a half the planet that is encircled by material connections between us um a radio waves that are connecting my computer to a router that is um then going through some kind of little wire into the ground that is going probably from the island i am on to the mainland over there to join a kind of bigger cable uh, along that journey it will pass through like, large buildings filled with more computers that are running hot that require air conditioning to run that require local electricity resources that i can't possibly account for that all of this energy use and material is being mobilized just to carry our voices to one another at this particular you know moment and then of course that, that then is being carried out to whoever somewhere hopefully maybe is listening to this but also more materiality more stuff that's been mined out in the earth more you know the the plastics and the lithiums and all the various substances that go into the stuff around us you know and so on one level technology can be this thing that does estrange us in all these kind of ways socially uh, and individually as as well as as kind of environmentally and, uh, you know, mostly what I'm asking for in that moment is that we choose to see it in this way as something that can actually be part of creating that awareness. Just so I make the plea for AI to be this thing that, like, makes us more aware of other intelligences rather than blinding us to them. So, uh, you know, a kind of attentiveness to the to the materiality of technologies and much else, um, you know, allows us to actually reconnect in some way, to think of our place within these systems and therefore thus to kind of change our behavior and uh, thought around them and to think better about what their place in our kind of politics or thinking actually is um, and not to kind of disregard this huge part of our culture and politics um, but to see it you know just another domain in which we have we have choice in, in which we have what I increasingly call agency one of the things that I've studied quite a lot in time is the way in which Technology broadly disempowers people, uh, despite the apparent kind of power it gives, because it takes so much control of the world around us out of our hands, out of most of our hands. You know, whether that's uh, kind of automated systems that are doing our job or determining our social position or ordering our social lives, um, so much of that work is done kind of completely invisibly to us. And the idea is always that that makes our lives easier. But of course, what it's doing is disempowering us. It's taking potential choices out of our lives in various ways, choices over the kind of information we consume, but also the kind of labor relations, personal relationships, those decisions kind of disappear from us. And the result of that, I feel very strongly, is the kind of social world that we have now. You know, it's always been the kind of stated and unstated, but more stated than most, um, belief that these kind of communications technologies that have overtaken the globe in the last hundred years would produce some kind of magical consensus right, that we'd, we'd kind of all come together around new forms of truth and ability and power and experience to produce a better world based on these technologies. Um, that hasn't happened. In fact, what we see broadly culturally around the globe is increased fundamentalisms, increased polarization, as, um, as there's a complete failure to reach any kind of accord. And in fact, that there's mostly the communication that happens through these platforms is incredibly divisive uh, and brews a kind of anger um, that I, that personally, I feel is based on a on a fear and a real sense of that disempowerment that they produce. There's a direct connection between the complexity and the opacity 
of these technologies that we use every day and the general sense of kind of fear uh, shading into anger and rage is the kind of dominant tenant of our times. And I see that very much in the um, in our responses to planetary crisis as well. Um, that you know the planetary system, as we are now aware of it, again through technology, is so extraordinarily complex, uh, and so obviously in a really hideously terrifying sense of chaos and danger. But that most of us have no way of responding to that in any meaningful way and so again our result is this kind of fear shading ang into anger and fear primarily helplessness in the face of vast global change everyone knows something terrible is occurring and nobody knows what we could possibly do about it we're all frozen in place by this kind of climate trauma this climate anxiety and the realization of, of what's going on and so now mostly i'm concerned with you know what are these practices of um of drawing kind of connections, of making, of speaking about these, um, the potential of um, so much of the stuff around us, whether it's technological or ecologically, kind of considered differently to make us more capable of taking action in some way, not as a process of kind of revelation of just going, look, look how bad the situation is, but like pointing out the actual mechanical basis of it, uh, whether that's in our technology or whether it's in our relationship to other beings, we are capable of operating on and with the world around us at the most amazing level, whether it's through the use of computers. So in my computational work, I often teach people to code at really simple levels, not as a chance to get a job, but so that they don't feel so disempowered by the technology that they use every single day. And likewise, in ecological work, you know, that can take the form of, uh, you know, one of the things I do is I teach people to wire up solar panels. So they don't feel that their relation to the climate is so completely radically uh, alienated or talk about going out and actually talking to the trees or getting to know the bees or do, having these kind of direct relationships which shift us from a position of total helplessness and total fear into one of awareness and relationship and agency that actually allows us to have a meaningful relationship with the world once again and therefore perhaps to, to start to perform the kind of shifts in consciousness and action that are so necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy you spoke to that or, or all of those things because I was definitely thinking about how social media dysregulates us and also how AI takes away our ability to act. And that was where I wanted to go in this next question. You had brought up how much of this overculture distracts us and guides our attention in really specific ways. And there's an, something you wrote titled, Air Pollution Rots Our Brains. Is that why we don't do anything about it? That's the title. And you write, multiple studies have shown that the way in which social media regulates our information intake for profit leaves us more divided, less politically aware, and increasingly prejudiced and violent, end quote. And I wonder on a bigger level, when we are in so many ways, being called to stand and fight for our loved ones, the health of our loved ones, for ourselves, for the land we live on, for our water. And the fact that we make decisions or allow decisions to be made without a struggle or without resisting in terms of poisoning our own water, it's really interesting just on such a basic level how distracted and almost paused in our own tracks we are for things that are seemingly very clear that we should want to stand up for. So I guess the <laughs> this question of like, how do these algorithms function in making us less capable of action? Again, it, you know, I, I wouldn't just reduce it to, to the algorithms. Like systems are built, um, many of them, you know, with very much the intention to distract us. They don't really care what they're distracting us from. Um, like I don't think every single person who builds like, you know, some stupid mobile game is actively trying to, uh, you know, hasten the destruction of the planet because it means we pay attention to that and not that. Um, but, you know, in part, that is the result just because we're very bad at choosing where we direct our attention. And that's not really a modern problem or anything else. That's essentially the, the central lesson of every major world religion throughout history or any kind of major spiritual practice is about paying attention um, to the here and now in various kinds of forms. Um, attention is this kind of incredible, um, is a superpower. 
when you choose where to where to direct it. Um, but most of us, you know, don't have that choice um, because we lack, uh, you know, it's it's so hard to maintain a kind of awareness of the ways in which we are being distracted. But also, I mean, really, really critically, uh, we're also traumatized. We're also living under circumstances that are almost totally unbearable. That most of us are in the position of struggling every day um, for like our, our, you know, our daily survival under capitalism in incredibly precarious situations where we can't barely think how we might change our lives. Uh, we're told that the situation of the world is in some way our fault, um, that it's due to our you know, individual behaviors that the world is the way that it is. And yet there's no way in which the kind of actions that we're capable of taking, most of us in the present moment, will have any effect on that whatsoever. So we, we're faced with that realization that we are we are kind of genuinely helpless, and we're also traumatized, like deeply and psychologically, by the level of which things are happening. It is the most damaging kind of thing that can happen to anyone psychologically is to be that kind of level of helpless. And what it does is 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 what trauma does, which is that it freezes us in place. Uh, it makes us completely incapable of of changing our situation. Like, you know, at the at the highest level, you see this in you know, things like PTSD, which are around very specific, deep forms of direct trauma, where people will continue to kind of relive and reenact that moment of trauma and be unable to kind of break out of this cycle. We're, we're all in similar cycles to that because of the trauma of everyday life and also the very specific trauma of realizing the, the existential danger that our biosphere faces in the present moment. And we're all traumatized by that realization. And no matter of we can talk about it all the time and we can blame various factors um, and we can certainly can blame certain factors and we should blame oil companies and, and you know the biggest contributors to this that do far far more than any kind of individual um, but none of that really matters you know we all know how bad the situation is what matters is is essentially kind of treating our own trauma in that sense by reconnecting ourselves to the world around us in really meaningful ways is a prerequisite to any kind of change that might occur you know earlier on we were talking about the individualism that is a, is a result of both these kind of algorithmic and social political corporate systems and is also a result in part of just our embodiment as humans and the power of of overcoming that in various ways you know one of the people i return to quite a lot is gregory bateson it was very clear that um you know and this is way back in the kind of 1960s and 70s that the environmental crisis as it would be termed at the time things like the pollution of, of lake erie um were a psychological crisis were a mental crisis were a kind of a sickness of of society that was infecting the world in this way um he spoke you know he, he wrote extensively about the fact that um that we'd driven lake erie mad through our own kind of madness and uh, that, that we were in this kind of what he called an eco-mental relationship with the with the environment around us that continues and so Part of the work is understanding how we heal our own relationships, which is how we heal the world. It's not through kind of recycling or trying to sustain in various ways the, the terrible, terrible social situation that we find ourselves in at present. It is always going to be about a radical, radical shift in the nature of work and the nature of understanding and ultimately in the, in the nature of consciousness um, that happens both at the practical level, but also at this kind of like spiritual level of awareness as well. Thanks for listening to For the Wild. The music you heard today is by Memotone. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Julia Jackson, Jackson Krupp, and Evan Tenenbaum.